stop watching this video. No, seriously, stop watching it. Seriously. Why are you watching this video? Think about what you're feeling right now. Really, think about it. I just told you to stop watching this video, and you had no idea what was going to happen. Yet, you decided to keep watching it, and here you are. Admit it, you wanted to stop watching. You really thought about it. There must have been some reason why I was telling you to stop. But if you can hear me right now, then you're clearly watching. And that really awkward feeling that you have, that feeling that something isn't right, that, my friends, is cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance theory was founded by psychologist Leon Festinger in 1957. It's used to explain that discomfort that you get when you feel that things just don't match up. In psychology, it's most commonly defined by a person's actions not being congruent. That is, that their actions don't match what their thoughts and beliefs are. For example, if I believe that jumping off a cliff would really, really hurt, but I still went ahead and did it anyway, that feeling of those not matching up is cognitive dissonance, and probably a whole lot of pain too. But cognitive dissonance goes much deeper than that. It's not just thoughts and behaviors. It could be thoughts and other thoughts too. Like when you know you shouldn't eat that last slice of pizza, but it tastes so good and you just really need it. But it's late at night and you know you shouldn't eat right before bed, but look at the cheese and the crust and the grease and the heartburn, but pizza. Eat the pizza. Boom. Cognitive dissonance. And finally, there's expectation versus reality. Have you ever walked into the cafeteria on taco at night only to find out that they've ran out and are now serving just pasta? That feeling? It's more than disappointment. It's cognitive dissonance. So cognitive dissonance theory is based on two assumptions. One, Whenever we experience discomfort from two events not being congruent, we'll take steps to reduce the amount of stress that we're experiencing. And two, we'll try to avoid future situations that will cause future cognitive dissonance. How do we do this? Well, let's look at each of these assumptions a little bit more in depth. Reducing cognitive dissonance. Festinger says that we do this in one of three ways. One, we minimize the dissonant thought. Have you ever convinced yourself that a D wasn't a bad test grade because, well, the teacher's a little bit difficult and doesn't really give out anything above a B? Two, we overplay consonant thoughts in order to drown out the dissonant thought. I mean, this was just one test, right? You'll still get an A on everything else and end up with a decent grade in the end. Or finally, three, we accept the dissonant thought and work it into our beliefs. That is, you finally admit that you didn't study enough for that test, and you resolve to study more on future tests. Now, for avoiding future cognitive dissonance, Festinger says that we do this in one of two ways. First, we avoid situations that will lead us to future cognitive dissonance. For example, you might say, I'm never going to take that professor's class again. Or two, you can limit the information that you receive to only congruent events. For example, the next time you get a test, you might purposely not look at that grade because you know you probably could have done a little better. Now, when studying cognitive dissonance, there are a number of ways that we might go about reducing this stress. It's important to note, though, that the theory does not provide a way for us to predict how someone will react to cognitive dissonance. However, researchers have broken our actions up into four different ways of looking at them. First, there's free choice. Researchers look at the idea of free choice when someone consciously makes a decision that doesn't fit in with their beliefs. Second is induced compliance. 
Induced compliance is when you use an external motivator as justification for doing something that you don't want to do. For example, you might not want to wake up and go to class every morning, but the value of your education and the value of your degree makes it worth it, so you experience less cognitive dissonance because of this. Third is belief disconfirmation. Belief disconfirmation is when you see or hear something that's different from what you believe, but instead of accepting it, you find ways to further prove your prior beliefs. Finally, we have effort justification. This states that the more time and effort that you put into doing something, the less dissonance you'll experience from it. So if you went through a series of 10 interviews, a grueling background check, and months of follow-up just to get the job that you have now, You'll feel that it was more worth it, even if you absolutely hate your job. Cognitive dissonance has a place in almost any communication discipline. It's actually used a lot in marketing or advertising when you try to convince people to use your product or they'll be sorry. This creates cognitive dissonance each time the consumer doesn't use your product because, well, they'll be sorry. Cognitive dissonance is also used a lot by politicians, public relations professionals, crisis managers, and even charity organizations. Think about how awful they make you feel every time you don't donate to one of those Save the Children charities. It's important that we, as communications professionals, understand cognitive dissonance and how to use it to our advantage, but also how to overcome it.